I will give you a general overview this morning in the time remaining. And then this afternoon, we are going into the text. We're going to do some very close exegesis of Acts 2.38 and other passages. We'll look at Greek authorities. Uh, if you have a Greek New Testament, bring it with you. Be prepared to take notes. We're going to look at their view of baptism. Campbellite theology claims that water baptism by immersion of adults unto remission of sins not only symbolizes regeneration, but it actually somehow enables the person to touch the blood of Jesus. Now, there's a lot of semantics that goes on. A Church of Christ person would say, baptism doesn't save you, the water doesn't save you, but when you're baptized, you touch the blood of Jesus. This is in order to avoid the problem that the water is washing away the sins instead of the blood of Christ, because as I debate them and I try to get them to say what exactly washes away the, the sin, they want to say water, and five minutes later they'll say baptism, but at that point they'll say the blood of Jesus, because there's too many verses about we are forgiven through the shedding of his blood, and the idea of the water versus the blood that gets them, but in the end, what they're saying is that baptism is the means of being the laver of, or the lather of regeneration. Thus, faith is not enough to touch the blood. Faith is not enough to be saved. Obedience to God's law must take place or salvation is not possible. And the obedience that is particularly in view is the obedience to be baptized. Adults only immersion only, and it must be done according to Campbellite theology. So it can't be done by the Baptists or whoever it is. To evangelicals, to add anything to faith, even baptism, is nothing more than a works salvation, and we are dealing with a shall p linguistic gain when they claim that you touch the blood. And may I point out, by the way, as I've challenged Church of Christ pastors at that point, Bible names for Bible things. Would you please show me chapter and verse for, quote, touching the blood? They fumble around, and they finally admit they don't have one. This is what the cults love to do. You've got to have chapter and verse. And when you point out they don't have a chapter, they don't have, a ver they don't have half a verse, then all of a sudden that principle doesn't mean anything. I want to give you at this point uh, 11 reasons overview. I wish we had time to go into this. Number one, if the Campbellite doctrine is true, then the leaders and founders of the Restoration Movement were never saved themselves. The only baptism the Campbells ever had, first was as an infant from the Presbyterians and then at the hands of a Baptist clergyman. They themselves were never rebaptized unto remission of sins according to Campbellite theology. So the founders of the movement were unregenerate, unsaved men. This always shakes up the Church of Christ, thinker, disciple, because here they are exalting these men who are the restorers of the gospel, and I point out they were no more saved than coon dogs. They were never rebaptized. And if their Baptist baptism, and one of them says, well, the Baptist baptism was sufficient, then I said, then it's sufficient for me. No, it's not. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Secondly, Jesus never baptized anyone, and this is very funny. If it is by baptism that people are saved, Jesus never saved anybody because he never baptized them. If baptism was so essential, why didn't he ever do it? He never baptized a single individual. Number three, Paul did not view baptism as part of gospel preaching, for in 1 Corinthians 1, 14 through 17, he said, Christ called me to preach the gospel and not to baptize. As a matter of fact, I don't even remember all the people I have baptized. That slips, that's not important to me. I want the gospel. If you listen to the Campbellite, the Mormon, the Christadelphian, the disciple of Christ, baptism is part of their gospel preaching. Yet the Apostle Paul, exegetically, in terms of grammar and syntax, content, very clearly makes a distinction between preaching the gospel is not the same thing as baptism. Baptism is over here, gospel is over there. Fourthly, if you turn in your Bible to Mark 1 and verse 4, 
you will find that John's baptism was, quote, unto remission of sins. That's exact terminology. Yet we learn in John, in Acts 19, 1 through 5, that John's disciples had to be rebaptized. If baptism unto remission of sins meant regeneration, sins are forgiven, and this is what John did according to Mark's account, then no one who was baptized under John the Baptist should be rebaptized. They were already saved. But Paul made them get baptized again. Did John's baptism save anybody? When I put this to Church of Christ, Disciples of Christ, or whatever they are, they're very nervous on that point. They often say, well, of course John's baptism saved them. I said, well, then why did they need Christian baptism? Well, then it didn't save them. I said, you've got to make up your mind, honey. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Fifthly, since there is only one God, the Apostle Paul tells us there's only one way of salvation, be it for Gentile, Jew, Old Testament, or New Testament. This is found in Romans 3, 28 through 30. Seeing there is only one God, there is only one way. The Jew gets saved by faith, and the Gentile gets saved through faith. He doesn't mention baptism. It's strictly on the basis of faith alone in the one true God alone. This means that whatever is necessary for salvation today was also necessary in Old Testament times. This is the heart of Paul's argument, showing that the gospel that he preached was according to the prophets, as he states in chapter 1, as well as according to the apostles. Baptism was not a right in the Old Testament. It was not necessary. Sixthly, the gospel of justification by faith alone apart from obedience to God's command is taught in the Old Testament and the New Testament, according to Paul. That's why in Romans 1 he says the gospel was preached the gospel of God. He doesn't say the gospel of Christ. He says the gospel which was beforehand proclaimed in the prophets. And Paul, in the book of Romans, is answering the Jews who said, oh, this Christian gospel is a Johnny-come-lately. We believe in the Old Testament, not this Jesus bag. And this is why the Apostle Paul begins by saying that the gospel is rooted in Old Testament theology and experience. This is why he argues that Abraham was justified before the law was given, Romans 4, 1 through 5. David was justified after the law was given, in Romans 4, 6 through 8. So it doesn't matter if you're before the law or after the law. They were justified by faith alone, apart from obedience. Abraham was justified by faith before he was ever circumcised. It was by faith and faith alone. Seventhly, baptism in the New Testament is parallel to circumcision in Colossians 2, 11 through 12. It's there in black and white. Was circumcision essential to salvation? Was circumcision enough? Or even if you were a circumcised Jew, you still had to be baptized. Well, they willingly admit that circumcision did not save anyone. Circumcision did not regenerate anyone. Circumcision did not forgive. If it did, why would you need Christian baptism? Or why would a circumcised Jew need to get baptized to be saved yet again? Doesn't make any sense. Eighthly, as I said in Romans 4, 9 through 11, particularly verse 16, 23, and all the way to chapter 5 and verse 2, we are.